Would you like to attach a face to that voice? When you subscribe to the Book Interrupted YouTube channel, you get to see everybody, as well as check out a bunch of extra Book Interrupted videos and music content. Visit the Book Interrupted YouTube channel to see what you've been missing. Parental guidance is recommended because this episode has mature topics and strong language. Here are some moments you can look forward to during this episode of Book Interrupted. So just go on a killing spree, actually. No, uh, not oh, kill yeah. them. <laughs> that would make such a better story. <laughs> Is the result of intergenerational years of trauma. Yeah. And there still is love. Do you yeah. really just want them to go on YouTube and figure it out? Or do you want them to get a sex ed? And like, yeah. this is pretty innocence. But let's pull 10 teeth on the same day mm -hmm. you know, from a child. It shows that colonial system that it's trying to keep and trap Indigenous people on reserves. They said absolutely true, diary. Ban it. We can't have people knowing. <laughs> of an Indian? Yeah. No. Nope, nope, nope. Yeah. We don't want to hear <laughs> <Nope>. it. <laughs> Disrupted. Mind, body, and soul. Uh, Inspiration is the goal. Uh, and we're gonna talk it uh, out. On Book Interrupted. Welcome to Book Interrupted, a book club for busy people to connect and one that celebrates life's interruptions. During this band book cycle, we're reading The Absolutely True Diary of a Part Time Indian by Sherman Alexie. If you'd like to join along, this book cycle is from October 1st to January 1st. Although critically acclaimed, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi has also been the subject of controversy and has consistently appeared on the annual list of frequently challenged books since 2008. And it became the most frequently challenged book from 2010 to 2019. As a result, a small collective of schools have challenged it, and some schools have blocked the book from distribution in school libraries or inclusion in the curricula. For example, one school in 2011 had a ninth grade language arts teacher pilot the diary in his curriculum, and with the help of his students, reported to the school's board on the inclusion of the book in a high school curriculum. Parents of students in the class were notified ahead of time that the teacher was interested in the book, and as a result, parents were able to opt their student out of reading the novel if they so chose. In June, the school board voted 3-2 to remove the book from the school entirely. Board members had not read the book, but cited the Split Instructional Materials Committee vote as the reason to ban the novel. The board members later learned that some members of the Instructional Materials Committee had not read the book, and so the board members agreed to vote again, but read it for themselves before the vote. On July 11, 2011, the school board voted 4-1 to one to reverse its earlier decision. The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian was the most challenged book in the United States from 2010 to 2019 and was named one of the top 10 most challenged books in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2017, 2018, 2020, and 2022. The book has been challenged for the following reasons. Acknowledging poverty, alcoholism, and sexuality. Allegations of sexual misconduct by the author. Offensive language, profanity. Cultural insensitivity. It was deemed anti-family. Depictions of bullying gambling, racism, references to drug, alcohol, and smoking, religious viewpoint or anti-Christian content, sex education, sexual references, unsuited for age group, and violence. Author Alexi has defended the novel by emphasizing the positive learning opportunities readers gain from exposure to these harsh aspects of contemporary life. He describes his own experience of adults trying to hide and protect him from suffering and hardship. All during my childhood, would-be saviors tried to rescue my fellow tribal members. They wanted to rescue me, but even then I could only laugh at their platitudes. In those days, the cultural conservatives thought that Kiss and Black Sabbath were going to impede my moral development. They wanted to protect me from sex when I had already been raped. They wanted to protect me from evil, even though a future serial killer had already abused me. They wanted me to profess my love for God without considering that I was the child and grandchild of men and women who'd been sexually and physically abused by generations of clergy. 
Alexi said that students were also able to connect his story to their own difficult experiences with depression, attempted suicide, gang warfare, sexual and physical abuse, absentee parents, poverty, racism, and learning disabilities. He noted, I have yet to receive a letter from a child somehow debilitated by the domestic violence, drug abuse, racism, poverty, sexuality, and murder contained in my book. To the contrary, kids as young as 10 have sent me autobiographical letters written in crayon, complete with drawings inspired by my book that are just as dark, terrifying, and redemptive as anything I've ever seen. The book has been credited with addressing the experiences and issues faced by Native American students in the public school system. The absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian has been at the center of many controversies due to the book's themes and content, as well as its target audience of young adults. The book has both fervent supporters and concerned protesters. Some people thought it was the greatest book ever, and some people thought it was the most perverted book they'd ever read. This interruption is brought to you by Unpublished. Do you want to know more about the members and Book Interrupted? Go behind the scenes? Visit our website at www bookinterrupted.com book interrupted this interruption is brought to you by my stolen laptop (laughs) so you might be wondering why we didn't have an episode and if you didn't listen to our episode interruption that Kara did for us you wouldn't know that the reason we didn't have an episode last month is because just before I was finishing editing that episode and putting it out, my laptop was stolen. And it turns out a bunch of the stuff I couldn't recover. (laughs) Some things I could, some things I couldn't. So I couldn't recover my work, but I could recover most of the raw files. So I had to start again. And you'll notice in this episode that there is no personal journal for me or Kim because that was not recoverable. (laughs) but everything else seemed to be okay. Just bear with us. Some of the episode might be a little bit more choppy than normal, but I think all in all, we did okay. So my laptop wasn't recovered. It's gone for good, I think. Luckily, I have a desktop. It's a bit clunky, but thankfully, Apple helped me with that too. So now all of my things sync to the cloud so I won't lose things in the future. And my desktop is working better than ever. So not so bad after all. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. And uh, yeah, that was a real interruption. Book interrupted. All right, so it's personal journal time. Let's see what the members of Book Interrupted thought outside the group. Hey everyone, this is Ashley, and this is my first personal journal for the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian. And I'm very excited to finish reading the book. The first few chapters I felt were kind of sad because I feel it was really showcasing the racism and the difference of an inequality. And it made me sad reading that, knowing that so many Indigenous people have experienced relatively the same thing. But I do like there are some really funny parts in it. I like the way the author talks. I feel like it's authentic to Indigenous people, in my opinion, just kind of what I've experienced myself. Just some of the jokes, too, I feel are very on par. A funny story, though, I do just want to put this in. I was listening to the audiobook of this version. Apparently, the actual book version has some pictures in it, which is cool. I want to pick up the actual book so I can look at the pictures as well. While we're recording this on the Sunday, the night before was one of my good friend's weddings. In between the reception and the ceremony, I was trying to read more of the book just so I could give more of an opinion. It's been a crazy few days. The book is a, it's like it's an easy read. It's keeping my interest and it is a book that I wouldn't have personally read myself, which is one of the reasons I really enjoy doing the book club. Yeah, so 
I think it's good. I'm excited to hear what the other girls have to say. I'm going to go to the library and pick up an actual copy of the book because I want to see what the pictures look like. Yeah, I can't wait to finish it. So far, it's pretty good. As of right now, I would recommend it to people. Just hearing that, again, there are those pictures, I would recommend the actual book versus the audiobook. So far, I'm liking the audiobook. The voice, the person narrating it, their voice is quite nice and I know sometimes with audiobooks we can have like whiny voices or something we don't really like so I'm really vibing with that I think the book is good I think it's an awesome book to have open discussions with so I can't wait to find out why this book is banned kind of all the racism behind that and how it's still showcasing in our day-to-day -day lives. So I hope everyone can grab a copy of the book and read along with us because it's a good read. Thank you. So we're reading the last book of season three and it's the absolutely true diary of part-time Indian by Sherman Alexi. I believe I got that right. I already took the book back to the library. So I could check it on our website, but I'm pretty sure that's right. So <laughs> I'm not going to. And if I'm wrong, well, I'm sure you'll find out sometime in the rest of this episode. This essentially is a coming of age story. And I've read a lot of coming of age stories, especially in high school. This is why this book is banned because it's for an audience that's in high school. That's who's gonna most relate to it because the main character is a teenager and he's trying to find out who he is and how he fits and how his dreams fit into his reality and how he can accomplish his dreams. Does he have to go away from the comfort of everything he's known and the friends that he's closest to and feels safest with to achieve those dreams? And what will that mean to his relationships and how people view him and will he really belong? If he leaves the reserve, will he belong in that world? Will he belong in the world that he's currently in? Or will he kind of be an outsider in both worlds? I think a lot of high school students are, as part of their curriculum, are required to read some kind of coming of age story. And this has got the twist in it where it's from a different perspective than ones that I would have read in high school. Cause you know, I was in high school years ago, 20 years, no more, 25 years ago. <laughs> I graduated 24 years ago, oh my gosh. This seems like an age ago, but still, even though it was so long ago, because every teenager goes through that identity crisis maybe, or trying to figure out where they fit in the world, where their loyalties lie, how can they be true to themselves and still build these strong relationships with other people that they need. I think we all kind of go through that. So in that way, even if you're reading this book as an adult, it's relatable. You can kind of really get an idea of where the kid's coming from. The uh, drawings really add a good dimension to it. I guess the point is any coming of age story that's really true to all the stuff that kids are going through during puberty is a candidate to get banned. Because this one got banned because of sexually explicit content, I guess, maybe because of the talk of masturbation. But if you have a coming of age story that doesn't mention masturbation, maybe it's not being completely honest, or at least some sexual dimension. But that's not what this book is about. It's just a part of it. The book is really about an inner conflict. How can he achieve his dreams and still be who he is and be the future him that he wants to be to? You know, he's torn between two worlds and two times, you know, the, his past self, his future self, his growing up on the reserve and him wanting to go out into the world and, you know, achieve his dreams. That's about it. I really liked it so far. <laughs> I say so far. I read the whole book, but I'm not going to talk about the end until the next time we talk. So go out and get the book. I found it at my local library, so maybe you can too. Otherwise, you can just learn about it by listening to us. Okay. Let's listen in to this episode's group discussion. Here we are for the final conversation. That's right, right? Or the first conversation? Nope. No, first conversation. The first. <laughs> it's the first. <laughs> now I know that Kim read the book already. <laughs> oh my God, this is the first conversation. <laughs> this is bad. Anyway, here we are. I obviously thought we were somewhere else already once, but we weren't. <laughs> so here we are for the very first time ever to discuss the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian. By who? I don't remember. Sherman Alexi? Sherman Alexi. Alexi. Good name. I agree. I like the Alexi. 
rolls off the tongue. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is another example of, I thought this book was a memoir. It's kind of a memoir though. The author did base it on his experiences. Right. Even Mm -hmm. though it's not literally, this is what happened to me specifically, I'm admitting. Right. That's why it's interesting (laughs) because the title is the absolutely true. And you're like, well, but it's full of truths. So I guess that's the point. It's full of their truths. I also thought it was a memoir. The first couple of chapters I was reading as I was reading more, I was like, is it? I can't super tell. But yeah, the first part, like just kind of that backstory of him explaining his life growing up and stuff. Yeah, I was like, oh, cool. We're reading this person's whole life. But it, you know, (laughs) kind of changed a bit later. Yeah, I thought it was a memoir too. And I even went to the back to read about him. And I was like, oh, (laughs) oh, maybe not. Junior's not like, it's not him. Because I was trying to look, because you know how he says he has one eye is short-sighted and one eye is nearsighted and all the things he says? Yes. Right? So I was like trying to look at his picture of the author. I was like, I wonder if he's got like laser eye surgery or something. Like I I thought it was a memoir too. And then I realized, I was like, remember when it says a novel by? A novel means it's not a memoir. So Mm -hmm. don't make that mistake like you did with when dad- Oh no, but listen. Okay, so I'm- I'm on his uh, Wikipedia page. So he was born with hydrocephalus. Oh, okay. For the fluid in the brain situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He had to have brain surgery six months old. Oh, wow. So scary. His parents were alcoholics. So his mother achieved sobriety. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm just like reading and, and recording <laughs> things at the same time. So we're trying to be good <laughs> listeners. <laughs> I know. He There's excelled like- academically. Reading everything mm-hmm. available, including auto repair manuals. Nice. Ooh. So there's a little sample of how his right. story and his life overlap. Okay. It's interesting. I like it. I think like writing a biography sometimes would be tough or a memoir because there's other people that mm-hmm. might not want to be written about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Or just even the experiences they may have had could be so different for the other people say they ended up reading the book and they're like that's not what happened that's not their absolute truth you know that could be so tough I feel like that would be the hardest part about writing like a biography memoir for so, sure. yeah unless you wait till like everybody you're gonna write about is dead <laughs> just, like <laughs> oh wait till you're really old so morbid so just go on a killing spree actually no uh, not oh, kill yeah. them <laughs> <laughs> that would make such a better story. I just wanted to write my life story, but instead I had to kill everybody so that I could write my life stories. I'd rather write that book from prison. <laughs> you like write the first book? Yeah, time. oh, totally. <laughs> it's a good plan. You'd have all the time you needed to write. Is it a good plan? Oh, God, no. yeah. I mean, it's a good plan if you felt like you didn't have enough time to write your story. And also, it would be like a murder mystery. <laughs> Right? I don't know. Oh, totally. Like at the end, it would be like, it was me. Ha <laughs> ha. Now I'm in prison. Boy. Now I'm in prison. <laughs> no, I mean, like, you write your memoir and wait until everyone does, but publish it so then they don't feel upset. Okay. Oh, see, that's not what I was thinking. <laughs> and then also, if you died first in your will, you'd have to be like, when everyone else in this story dies, publish this book. Ha ha. Yeah, I got, the, I got the last laugh for the last <laughs> like, word. The last Sorry, word. My You're perspective public. reigns. <laughs> oh my God, you guys. I've been watching a lot of murder mysteries recently because I'm mm-hmm. out visiting my mother and that's all she watches is murder I mysteries and murder. all she reads is murder mysteries. And so when you guys are talking about that, that's all I could think about. I'm like, that might be yeah. a good one. So maybe yeah, totally. On that. Write a get book on about that killing spree mare. <laughs> A memoir. Killing everyone so you can write a memoir. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll have to get rid of them before this chapter is released. <laughs> It'd be more interesting if it was a serial in a newspaper. You know how they used to do that? You yes. Know, like like oh, a little yeah. bit at a time yes. and the person happens to die right before it's published. Every time. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. That's like Stephen Kingy. Oh, oh totally. Man. Yeah. That would be such a good TV show, I feel like. Yeah. I would, I would watch that. Person would have to have a very interesting life where, like, at first you wouldn't think these people were connected until the story comes out. Oh, like until the very end, too, where it shows how everyone was intertwined and connected. Yeah. yeah. You're the one person. Yes. You're the six degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever, but you're concealed until the finale. So whatever. Kevin Bacon would have to star in it, of course. Obviously. <laughs> he would be the first death. <laughs> the first one. <laughs> Make it the most meaningful. <gasps> Remember when Scream first came out 
and Drew Barrymore. Spoiler alert, all of you who haven't seen Scream from 25 years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Drew Barrymore gets murdered in the first 20 minutes. See? Everyone's like, yeah. Nobody thought they'd kill her. She's a main character. Yeah, that oh. was good. Yeah. Decoy. She yeah. Decoy. So okay. back to this book. How far has anyone, how far has anyone got? I read the whole thing. Oh my I'm god. Not. Okay, I'm not either. I would say so I'm listening to the audiobook and the audiobook is just under 5 hours and I have just over 2 left. Okay, so what's right happening on. right now in the book? Cuz yeah. then I'll talk about the stuff beforehand. I haven't gone beyond Halloween. I he's moved to the new okay. school and he's made friends. Has he made friends with anyone? Ashley at the new school? he sorry I'm just trying to think I just went to a wedding yesterday so my oh. brain is so foggy a little bit yeah I'm <laughs> sorry yeah he did yeah okay good. I would have oh, to so I was thought he was going to be in a fight with a bully yes and then okay. he punched the bully and now the bully's his friend yeah and uh, he went and that's all his... like more extreme than they expected at his new school which is awesome he's like this is just the rules what's going on I love that yeah. he called back he's like what's the rules and he's like, what <laughs> And he's like, oh. yeah, playground rules change depending on your school. So that's fun. I think that's this actually, book would make yeah. a good movie. Yeah. So I moved schools from Ontario to BC. So I did high school in BC and then did all my other schooling in Ontario up to that. And the rules, totally different. So oh my I, God. I was relating so hard. What are the rules? Like, could someone just tell me? You know, because yeah. they were just so different and you act one way and it's totally normal from where you came from. And then people are like, what are you doing? You know, like it's just <laughs> really? totally. So I, yes. Yeah, so I related to that. I felt like I was re-going through going to a new school again. I had that same experience, not even moving schools, just moving the provinces too. Because I moved yes. from Ontario to BC as well. Yeah. And I like right away noticed the difference. Even when I came on my first vacation, I was like, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. And I was so surprised that even within the same country, it could be so different. I don't know what I thought. Like I'd been to England before. And so it's not like I'd never been anywhere and realized that people might act differently or whatever but like I just underestimated the possibility of that within Canada I guess I don't even know mm. but when I came here I was like holy and I preferred the differences in BC I was like that's the way I want to do it <laughs> like, I feel the is, same way Kim it is when very I go obvious. Home. yes when I go home to Ontario obviously it's nice to visit but I try and tell them about how different life is in BC and you know they can't even grasp it but to me it's a lot more relaxing yeah it's exhausting it's just exhausting it is like you're in a race and you're like I didn't sign up for this race but everyone's (laughs) racing everywhere yeah and I don't want to live here (laughs) well it is the center of the universe so yeah (laughs) oh it's the views it's the people yeah everything feels like a race i'm just like i'm not racing anymore so uh and it's like uh intangible you don't realize you know what i mean like i didn't realize till i came here and i was like even just they don't even know (laughs) like niceness the thing that i can remember being really obvious to me and i mean this may be different now i don't think so though but when we came to bc There's like, if you're sitting on a patio, giant picnic tables. So Mm -hmm. like you and people you don't know might sit at the same table and you might even speak to each other. Yeah, It was like weird at first. I feel like if you were to yell over even, and you could also do it across the patio to another table that's not even attached to you and be like, hey, uh, where'd you get your pants? But if you did that in Ontario, people are like, are they talking to me? Like, who is that? Do you know that? I know them. Like there's this weird, I noticed that. And I was as Ontario at first uncomfortable, but then I was like, this is, everybody is so friendly. Yes. I felt like the views were a lot more liberal the further west i was going and so that was except for was... alberta there's a giant well, conservative yes. like cowboy wall and then we get yeah. to some <laughs> once you're over that hump <laughs> i don't know i live in northern bc so if you i think the at... cowboy wall extends up if there you look too at the spread, yes totally yeah, yeah, yeah it really of... does but we have a university here too so i'd say where i am is a mix mm-hmm. but if you're voting and you don't vote conservative They'll like your you're not gonna down. your per- candidate's not gonna win <laughs> but you do yeah it. You do it anyway yeah. yes <laughs> yeah. same in Edmonton when I was living there it's like you can vote for 
anyone else and it's almost a wasted vote because it's not going to change who's going in. We know it's conservative every time. But I think in a way it tell people use that data later and say a certain percentage voted not that. And then mm-hmm. I think that it steers what people like campaign for later on. So you might get mm-hmm. a little bit more liberal stuff into your mm-hmm. conservative candidate. If people are like, oh, if I keep doing this, I might lose the vote one day. Yeah. Fingers crossed. One day in the far future. Yeah, like they could be conservative and be like, I suppose I could get a little more liberal on that topic. Yeah. On that topic, somebody's voting. <laughs> on that one topic, though. <laughs> People are like, you're just throwing away your vote. I was like, whatever. I'm going to vote every time. Mm-hmm. I'm throwing away my vote if I vote the way I don't want to vote, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, if I don't yeah. want to yeah. vote conservative and I vote conservative, that's a throwaway <laughs> to me. Yeah. Or, like, people well, just yeah. won't show. You know, that's what people do. I'm not going to go because it won't matter. Oh, it matters. Vote, totally. everyone. It really yes. And my kids Absolutely. love going to the voting thing. They give them a sticker. You know, yeah. anything that gives them a sticker, they love it. Oh, you're teaching them so young, though. Like, they're probably going to remember that growing up. And then when they're older, be like, oh, it's time to vote. Let's go. Yeah, our whole family used to go voting together. And my grandmother was blind. So I could go in with her, even though I was underage, and pick for her. Oh, wow. Yeah. put her in the ballot, which is kind of cool. You're like, I really voted. (laughs) You poor grandma. You're like, yeah, you won. Too bad, grandma. We're choosing you you this time. (laughs) I would never. She took us so seriously. (laughs) <laughs> be very angry and she was nice when she wasn't angry she was nice but when she was angry you know what be on her bad side i guess we'll mm. find out when we read your memoir <laughs> you, won't. You, read it, you won't be reading it oh, oh yeah that's i great. have to be I dead get the person to read their chapter before i kill them and i go what do you think of this chapter and if they like it they survive <laughs> <That's so crazy. laughs> yes yes I, I love like your opinion on and this mental chapter. note love everything meredith writes from now oh on my god talk about childhood should we talk about the book yes about yes childhood. you know what <laughs> i think about this book i think that on the surface it's just this good story he goes over there he has a fight he meets a friend etc but i also think there's a lot of nuanced examples of implicit bias and Mm -hmm. potentially microaggressions and I think he does a pretty good job of capturing how subtle all of that can be it's not right out in the open but I still think it's there Mm -hmm. and so I think it was a good vehicle to try to bring those kind of experiences to light because you know he was a native person who went into what's known to be a white school and then that experience kind of provided the stage for those things to play out in ways that are easier to observe than just describing it I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think about that teacher why he went to the school? He's like, go where there's hope. You still have hope. Not being mad that he punched him. He's like, I deserve to be punched, basically. Yeah, he was like ashamed of himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. Teacher, I mean. The teacher yeah. was, yeah. yeah. Who did he ask where hope is? Hmm. Like, who has hope? Where's the most might hope? Have, yeah, who has the most hope? Yeah, I can't remember mm. who might said it. Might have been his it. mom. Was, I think it might have been his mom. And he's like, white people. And he was like, okay, I'm going to that school tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Was... So I think from experience and then also just from so I was raised very white did not learn really about any indigenous culture other than that it happened and in the beginning uh, one of the things he had said was he was born into poverty and they were basically told all their lives that they're not good they're not enough and how are they supposed to change that lifestyle if they're told that their whole life and then they start believing it and I thought that was so on point for how I think a lot of Indigenous people still currently feel because even I have friends who live on reserve even friends that don't and they have that internal belief I'm not good enough to be going working in a white area or going to school And I think it's interesting to see that some of those underlying themes are still currently, I think, happening. I think that hope conversation is a reflection of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Exactly that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. It was kind of nice at the beginning to be able to relate a lot of things and be like, oh my gosh, this is such a native thing even sometimes the way he talked me and my friends talk like this and so (laughs) I'm like oh that's just 
indigenous language type of thing just the jokes the type of jokes are type of jokes I make too and uh (laughs) I felt it was almost like reading my life too at some points growing up and having some of the same things that he went through obviously not to as extreme because I'm not disabled but uh yeah I thought it was interesting from an indigenous perspective I felt lucky to be able to read that perspective because Mm -hmm. I can't have it except for to be able to like get behind the curtain if by in reading a book or whatever. Yeah. And it's shocking as a white person. And some of the things that he talks about or just acknowledges as normal, you're like, holy, that's just Mm -hmm. the way that it is. Like walking 14 miles. It's like, well, I guess I'm going to walk 14 miles home. And, and that's just the top of my head example. Right. But I don't know. That's why I think it's important that we keep on checking it out. Cause you know, the, If you don't know about people or if you are at risk of discrimination or bias, the best way that you can help yourself is to try to find some people that are not like you and hang out with them. You know what I mean? So like, that's (laughs) the best move. I think that's how you can learn because you need to have other examples in front of you instead of like reinforcing the sameness that you come from. Yeah, absolutely. what, What you're saying Kim, there was parts in the book when his dad was dropping him off at the school and he said, you know, those white people aren't better than you. And he says in it, I know he doesn't believe that and Mm -hmm. neither do I. And I was like, that kind of statement blew me away. I was like, what? So reading what he's thinking, it changed because I didn't realize that he felt like that with his parents, that his parents didn't think that either. So I agree. It helps with that getting into someone's head. The way he does it too... The book is great because it's so young. His yes. thoughts yes. are so young. Almost like the way he's narrating in his head is like super pure and super innocent. So it really makes you get it. It is like the yes. absolute true diary. Like you really kind of get it. And him drawing pictures to make fun of himself and of the guy he punched the nose and his buddy, <laughs> like all these things. Like you get an idea. Anyway, I really like it too because it really does make you in his perspective, the way it's been written and drawn and really engages you the book because there's pictures and there's words. Mm -hmm. Talking about the uh, age that he's at in this book. It's like the age of the character because he's a teenager. One of the things that that people during those formative years, you're a teenager, you're trying to figure out where your like loyalties lie. And I think that's a lot of what this book is about is loyalty to other people in your life and to yourself, and to your past self and future self, how you balance all that. And it's just like complicated because he's changing schools and he's like his friend is feeling like he's betraying him. He's not being loyal and saying something that his going to the school is saying something negative about him. I like that theme of loyalty in the book because if he was a different age and moving there would be those themes but when you're a teenager that's kind of where Mm -hmm. you're not going to be focused so much on your parents as you were before you're focusing more on your friends and connecting with them as well and it's like very powerful how he kind of almost subtly shows the struggle that a lot of teenagers go through but it's just like complicated by the cultural clashing that's happening here colonialism yeah, yeah. You know? mm-hmm. it's like makes it so much more difficult because it's hard enough going through that age and trying to figure out where you fit in and where you want to be and still honor the person you were and where you came from, but also change from your parents and your family and all that stuff. So it's just it's interesting the time period that this book was written in, because it, I think it just magnifies everything, all of that as well by choosing a teenager to show it's even harder to be a teenager in this Mm -hmm. character's case Mm -hmm. yeah and also showing that I think as society we still need to show empathy towards youth you know I remember growing up and complaining about things that I felt were really hard at the time and still even looking back I think they were really hard and hearing from adults so many times you're a kid you don't pay bills you don't do this or this you have it so good etc and there will always be positives to things you know but it's also okay to be like this is tough and to talk about it and not have that toxic positivity because yes of course there are these awesome things that are happening but also life's tough And talking about that toughness can help bring other people together and be like, hey, I'm not alone. Other people are experiencing this and this is normal or maybe not normal or right, but 
there's so many people experiencing it, we can change it. Yeah, talking about it makes it easier to to deal with because people are like, oh, Mm -hmm. I deal with that too. Or whatever, full-grown adults comparing to youth or whatever. It's like, it's not helpful. It's, Mm -hmm. oh, you think you have a bad? Here's the thing I have bad. And you're like, well, that doesn't really help at all. Everybody's got their Mm -hmm. stuff, right? It's not a competition. Yeah, it's not a competition. It's not a competition. Instead, let's just support each other. Yeah. I also like how this book showed in spite of, you know, what you would at surface judge as negative alcoholism in a family or poverty or whatever and these things are also attached to indigenous people as all that they are in worst Mm -hmm. case scenarios this book also really was competent at showing there's a lot of love it's not a simplified like you know what i mean it's not just like this equals bad poor them You know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah, that's not ideal. That also is the result of intergenerational years of trauma. And there still is love, you know, and there's like, there's still this family unit, a glowing ember within all of the negativity that is the outcome of it. And I also think that there could be a way to look at this book. Him going to this new school and being accepted is almost like, the fantasy of rewriting history. You know, like white people were like, you shouldn't be here and we're hoping to eradicate you. That's the messaging for for natives, right? And it's like, and that's why they don't have the self-esteem. That's why they don't feel like they're as good as enough because that messaging has been everywhere always. And so him going over to this white school, fighting for a minute and then becoming part of it and being a valued member of it, I think is a cool way to look at a rewriting of history too in a Mm -hmm. microcosm little story. And also showing that kids don't care. You know, at the end of the day, we're taught that hate and we're taught not trust different things. And I think at the end of the day, people want to connect. It doesn't really matter or it shouldn't matter, you know, the race, gender, ethnicity, et cetera. And I think that's one thing that's so pure about youth is they don't have that hate unless it's like instilled in them or it's, you know, really like taught to them. They will play with other kids and be like, we're twins and could be totally different races, right? But because they both have the same haircut, they think they're twins and that's so cute and pure and so I think that is also kind of showing too that kids want to connect at any age they'll find their people and when they do it can be such a beautiful thing and you might not fit in in your first or second place but there is a spot for you somewhere and you will find that group of people that you're supposed to be with yeah Mm -hmm. My husband's going to come home at some point, just so you guys know. (laughs) So I'm kind of like semi-distracted because I'm so. (laughs) I hope he comes home at some point. I hope so. (laughs) I just mean during this taping. So I'm kind of distracted because I'm like, text me so I can mute. He's forgotten some key or something. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And here's another thing. Do you guys know this? Sarah has a cat in Senegal. Oh, yeah. That is literally literally the exact (laughs) same as a cat that I have here in my house right now exact like it's a black cat with a white dot on the end of its tail that's it oh my god that's so crazy yeah isn't it I showed her a picture of my cat she was like wait and then sent a picture of her cat I was like (laughs) if only they could meet I know (laughs) they're twins hey on zoom you guys hold them up yeah 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 true. yeah i'm in ontario right now so my cats are back in senegal oh my gosh you're in canada right now she doesn't travel with her cats can you imagine okay, bringing so. a cat on a 24-hour trip oh, i wouldn't either lord help you yeah when i traveled to ontario there was a woman traveling with cats no, no. in her bags that she brought onto the plane like not brutal wherever you send animals that are. Did it meow the whole time that, yeah mm-hmm. not that i noticed yeah, yeah. Oh, she probably drugged it that's what people do right when they travel with the cats sometimes it's true people drug their cats yeah oh, no totally yeah 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 and you do it with human antihistamines well yeah because they get so much anxiety yeah <laughs> do you yeah, yeah me and nancy when we drove from ontario to bc her cat was crazy because she knew he didn't travel well anyway and so she googled mm-hmm. like what do we do and whatever so it was human antihistamines I can't remember now like Sudafed or whatever what we didn't know though was that cats have this built-in defense mechanism 
where if they eat something, I guess, poisonous or whatever the body registers is foreign, they'll foam up like a crazy rabid. Nancy's freaking out already because she's high strung as it is. So we give this cat this dosage and it immediately starts like like foaming at the mouth and I'm like rapidly googling like, we kill this cat? like what's happening but it was just normal and then oh, wow. for the rest of the trip that was business as usual no problem give the cat the thing it foams like a crazy <laughs> beast and then it goes to sleep for six hours oh my God. <laughs> that's so traumatic I know. for you and the cat <laughs> yeah well no for Nancy <laughs> really cat. like yeah I just, like, I'm not taking any food from that lady <laughs> <laughs> like Bottom, when like, we get home I'm running away <laughs> totally, yeah. oh my god what, what is this time? torture oh um i have a quick question about the book so yeah we picked what? this book Come on. because we picked oh, wow. this book because let's talk about pets yeah. <laughs> people love hearing about our pets right this is the pet podcast right yeah. <laughs> talking about pets the part where his dog died oh. Oh, that was so devastating because he asked his mom, she said they're broke. He goes, well, I'll pay you back. He didn't understand. He's like, I'll get a job. And she's like, yeah, we don't have the money today. Yeah, we can't. Can't. Yeah. Another example of poverty and differences and whatever. Absolutely. Yep. What was wrong yeah. with that dog? Because I don't remember this part. Yeah, I was having seizures, I think it was. And um, he was really I don't hot remember for why. and shaking yeah. and he touched him, he'd whine. They didn't really know because he's like, we have to take him to the vet. He's just really yeah. sick. And they were like, we can't. Like, we just can't. Yeah. It's not and an it, option for us. Yeah. And, and it probably would have cost $1,000 realistically. That's what she said. Or more. To get, it's to thousands yeah. Of yeah. Dollars. yeah. Yeah. The vets, it's hard. Yeah. yeah. And that's so, the way they dealt with it, I think is very true to still how things are dealt with when it comes to sick animals on reservations because I think the poverty is still running very rampant in almost all native communities. I also wanted to touch base on there was fighting. The main character would get so upset. I feel like they were pushed to their limits multiple times and then would finally fight back and they were the one that got in trouble every time. It's like, you know, you push someone to their tipping point. They're so cruel to this person. And then once they explode, then they're then demonized. And I think that happened a couple of times in the sense that, you know, when he he threw the book and he hit his teacher, he thought he was going to jail, you know? I, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he was just like, oh, you know, like when this kind of stuff happens, it's so extreme. He's going to jail. That's so sad I think it's hard when people are being bullied or they're in a a lower socioeconomic status community and you know he was so upset that book was 30 years old he was so upset that he was being bullied etc etc that's a totally normal you know being so upset yes yes and you know he got then he got suspended and then you know he got in trouble etc and it's what about the people that brought him there, brought him to yeah, that point, like, you know? If you put somebody in a desperate situation, well, then desperate people do desperate yeah. things. Like you just, you can't Absolutely. predict. Maybe the best way to not make somebody do desperate things is to not put them in a desperate situation. Yeah. <laughs> where they have or no not options. treat them like shit, you know? Right, where they don't have any choices. Yeah, and then you, you know, society still is, oh, well, why do Indigenous people do X, Y, Z? It's like, well, this has been centuries going on in the making, you know, and of course things are going to come to a head at some point. And it's just so ironic that it's almost always the indigenous communities that are painted as bad. Yeah, because it's not a reflection of their character. It's like a reflection of their trauma. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And their lack of options. So Mm -hmm. there's one part of the book where he had to get 10 teeth taken out because. Yes. um, At one time. at, he had to do it all at one time because they yeah. only will cover one appointment yes. like stuff like that like my son had to get some cavities done and they wouldn't even let him do both sides on the same appointment mm-hmm. because they're like oh we wouldn't want to freeze him on both sides yes. that might be uncomfortable but let's pull 10 teeth on the same day mm-hmm. from a child like, you know from a child because you I only think get covered in- once a year mm-hmm. And that's that's... another thing too, is, you know, you'll hear society say, oh, well, Indigenous people, they get free healthcare, they get et cetera, et cetera. And it's obviously it's a lot better than what it was 
back when he was a child. But at the same time, it's we're still going through hoops. There's so much limitations to it. And all this free stuff is sometimes causes more issues in the end. It might be expensive to access too, It's right? like begrudgingly free. Yes, yes. Oh yeah, here, we'll give it to you, but you have to get all 10 teeth pulled in one thing because we're not paying for more than that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's not mm-hmm. like, let us take care of you. Yes, you know? yes. Like- it, it's almost, it feels like the government is annoyed that they have to do this. And so it's like, how can we make this as annoying and hard for you as possible? Yeah. 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 It's like pulling teeth to get anything from them, you know? (laughs) Pulling teeth. That's right. That's well done. That was well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Yes. Mic drop. And And on that note. (laughs) I wanted to ask you guys, we are reading this book because it was banned in places. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm only a third away through. So far, there's nothing in it I would say, oh, that's why it's banned. I don't know. Masturbation? Do we know why it was banned? Well, I'll look it up. But yeah, the masturbation is my main guess. But I'd also say okay. like even just like the alcoholism and... That's kind of what I thought too. Yeah. The the fighting type of thing. Or- like the truth the truthness of it all it's probably yes. banned because yeah of the truth. that's kind of that's kind of what i was thinking yeah they said absolutely true diary ban it we can't have people knowing <laughs> of an indian yeah no. nope 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 yeah we don't want to hear <laughs> <Nope>. it <laughs> but even our... masturbation it's for teenagers right yeah uh, yeah we're doing yeah, it like the vaginas, teenagers masturbating the yeah, vaginas the in the other one got it banned people don't like genitals yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, sure, yeah. They don't the, like sexually active people. It's yeah. You know. <laughs> don't talk about sex. Well, yeah. I want to know. On the book interrupted website, what we have here is Oh good, great. This book was the most challenged in the US between 2010 and 2019. It was banned for profanity, sexual references, and allegations of sexual misconduct. On a October 14th, to... Crestwood School District MI, so maybe Michigan. Superintendent sent out a mass email informing the public that the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian was removed from the ninth grade curriculum due to vulgar language and explicit reference to male or female genitalia. Told there you. There it is. Don't it's talk the about masturbation. Ninth yeah, grade? I mean, That's in so many schools, they, do, they still don't even want to talk about sex ed. So I think maybe having books that reference it, then they have kids who are asking questions maybe and they're like we don't it's just wild in this day and age a lot of children not all children but a lot of children have like cell phones and a tablet and access to the internet whenever they want they know what a penis is and what a vagina Mm -hmm. is they know about masturbation do you really just want them to go on youtube and figure it out or do you want them to get a sex ed and like this is pretty innocent you know you're gonna have the sexual feelings unless you get you know the drugs and the giver (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is also uh, the use of the N-word. So oh, uh, okay. on Hudson School District halted lessons after they received complaints from an African-American student and classmates when an eighth grade teacher read a passage from the absolutely true diary of a part-time mm. Indian that included a character's racist joke featuring the N-word. Why, the Why would the teacher it? then say that? that? It's written in the book, though. Honestly, like full disclosure, yeah, yeah. I said yeah. it when I was reading it to Fred. And he was like, <gasps> and I was like, oh, my God. Like, I freaked out, yeah. too, because I'm just reading. And then it's defenders of the, the book, fight. including English teachers and faculty department chairs, students of the board at Hastings, and blah, 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 decreed what they called censorship of the book. But the school district administration has said its priority is protecting students and that schools should be sensitive to the historic marginalization of students of color. So this is something that bothers me in critical race theory is about teaching how woven into every aspect of society racism and oppression is. Some people argue on the other side that it's it perpetuates it in some way to call everything racist. That's kind of like the shallow response, you know, like everything's not racist, but that kind of just reminded me of that when it says it in the books i just read it is when those bullies said that to him i know it's an example that's when yeah and that's when he punched them in the face yeah like being like too far Mm -hmm. right so i think that's an example of things that actually happen to kids in the playground i also think if you're a teacher reading the book aloud maybe just 
don't you say the word out loud. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't, uh, yeah, like know ahead of time. Yeah. and It's not your children. Explain. Just, yeah. Right, all right. Yeah. And just, or just you know, have the kids read it. Don't read it to them. In ninth grade, for real. Like, yeah, why are you reading grade? to your children? Yeah. Why are you reading aloud? It's a, a great <laughs> opportunity, though, to have a conversation around why mm-hmm. the N-word is so crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. For who can say it? Who can't say it? Why do you hear it in raps? Like, to get really into the history of mm-hmm. the whole situation. Like, it's a good... Uh, all things that get censored, if handled appropriately, are excellent vehicles to educate. Yeah, mm-hmm. learning tools. You're a teacher. <laughs> yep. Teach. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They could have had discussion questions. Yeah, but you know, also not every teacher is going to feel comfortable being like, well, I guess we're talking about this now. I'm just saying some teachers would and some teachers would be like, I'm just going to pretend that didn't happen. I just, you know, they're just human beings, right? Like, no, oh, totally. You know, yeah. it's the same yeah. cross section of population and teachers as the rest of the population that might not. And I mean, it matters them. if people who are African American, like people who are part of the history related to the N word, if they complain, you yeah, have totally. to listen. You know what yeah. I mean? It, mm-hmm. If that matters, you can't just be like, it's educational. It, like you can't, we can't just brush it off, if, you know. So it's not uh, simple, I guess, is what we are simple. finding. Right? It's very complex. You have to also rely on the fact that the teacher is competent, and yeah, I mean, it's not a perfect world. Mm-hmm. So competent and educated, and not racist. What we also fun. know is if you write a book for children that 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 has any genitals in it, it'll be banned any genitals yeah. oh, so God, far yeah. so yeah. so far that's it if we identify something as a penis or a vagina <laughs> we do not get to talk about it any further if they hear even about though it. If half they the population has it. a penis and the other half half has a vagina and but we some can't population talk about it. has both <laughs> yeah well there and there <laughs> so, you go but too taboo cannot talk about it don't talk about it yeah <laughs> have it but don't let us know <laughs> <laughs> it's private does anybody else find that difficult to like explain to your children why certain parts are private parts my kids are just like but why they're still like but why Mm -hmm. and like you just need to cover it up you just don't show Mm -hmm. to people (laughs) like yeah and it's also it's pure because they are just well i don't get why their thing's different you know like they're just so pure that it's not for like a bad reason that they're asking or like curious about it yeah it's just so, so like why why does it matter if somebody sees ah. my butt i was like just don't yeah. show people your butts or uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they're like but my butt's the best <laughs> why totally. would I, you know it's, butts i don't are even awesome. like clothes yeah, i'm constantly it's... reminding my daughter that those are private because mm-hmm. she's like oh, oh my pants fell down i'm like it's not it's fine but just, just <laughs> that wasn't an accident get them yeah. up <laughs> Right, like, <laughs> what? I know. I knew you did that on purpose. Stop showing your butt. Yeah. <laughs> well, part of it is probably just the reaction that you get from mom. Like, oh, yeah. This yeah. gets mom going. I'm going to pull my pants down more. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I do it. I like the attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Whoops. Sorry, Sarah. Oh, my pants fell down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I want to say that when we first started talking about this book, I thought we were saying that it was a graphic novel, which it is, but it's more novel than graphic. So no, yes, and I like that. If this, if this mm-hmm. qualifies as graphic novel, this is my kind of graphic novel. Yeah, I like I, the I prefer the not comic book format. Right, the drawings were like a way of expressing his personality and how he deals with ideas and his feelings and thoughts and stuff and it's something a kid would do is like have little sketches about frustrations or whatever when we first started talking it was a graphic novel i was thinking more like more graphic less novel (laughs) um but anyway so that's interesting if somebody's wondering about that it's mostly just a novel with some drawings in it yeah so i'm listening to the audiobook oh um, and yeah yeah and so i didn't even know that there was pictures or anything in it because in the audiobook he's just kind of talking about like oh I do these pictures but there's no mention of this is a self-portrait of himself (gasps) see that is so cool yeah Yeah. did not know that was in the book at all see now I gotta pick up a version of the book and go look at it 
Yeah, you that should. Makes, I was just going to say that makes me wonder about if Funhouse could be done on an audiobook. Would yeah. it be just, and would it be like a play? Like, would there be different people having different, vo- anyway, so that just, that's just food for thought. That's as far <laughs> as I go with it. Just think about that. <laughs> Funhouse, audiobook. Discuss amongst that yourselves. Be really tough. I don't think this is considered a graphic novel. I think it's a novel with drawings. With graphics. But yeah. it was yeah. called that somewhere. Yeah, because yeah. I almost didn't pick it because it was called a graphic novel. Mm. Yeah, oh, okay. That was a discussion we had. Because I was yeah. like, I didn't like Funhouse. Who knows? Who knows why I didn't like it? Not me. <laughs> I know I for sure don't like the delivery in comic book form. No, I didn't like the way you're reading it. It was all bubbles and then text below. I really didn't like that format. So I Mm -hmm. thought this is like my second opportunity. But yeah, I could read ones like this. If this is considered a graphic novel. Right. I loved all the little pictures that are added to it. I think it adds to the book. I can read the novel without being every sentence interrupted. I hated that. I also think it's a good transition book for youth because, I mean, they're doing it in grade nine, but I'm doing it with my nine-year-old. He still likes a picture in a book, but I want to start reading more novels to him. So when we can find those novels that have a picture every chapter or whatever, like that helps bring him along if he's not fully buying in. Totally. Like a lot of uh, kids' first novels are pictures as well. Yeah. And mine was, I remember my first novel, it totally had, at the beginning of each chapter, there was, you know, like a picture for the chapter. And I would go back and read all those types of books when I started getting into bigger books too. So I, yeah, that's a really good point that the kids will like it. I really like books that each chapter starts with a quote. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Where they find this quote? (laughs) Right? Because people who write love writing. And they like words and books. Probably. They like quotes. Hey, they like they? Meredith, master of the obvious. <laughs> That's me. But they probably I, read a lot, right? So they have some interesting <laughs> quotes from places and everybody reads different stuff. So I like that. I, mean, I like to see how the quote at the beginning captures the chapter. I want it to be like the summary of this chapter or like a little uh, teaser. Teaser, Ooh, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's what yeah, I like, totally. the teaser of the quote. Like, oh, What's happening? I like also, and I wish also, you know, when a chapter starts with a giant letter, the first word in the, I want that giant letter to also start all of the rest of the words that are beside it. Not just oh, the first one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that okay. would be cool to do. Yes, Indeed. I like that as well. I wanted to mention that because we were talking about how he was drawing and stuff like that. He also says, I think near the beginning or middle-ish of the book, that the only Indigenous people that made it off the res were artists they were musicians actors type of things poets they were these very creative people and he was saying how you know he's poor he's gonna live in that forever and so he keeps drawing because he thinks that's how he's gonna make it off the reserve again so many people still to this day on reserves think well you know I'm stuck here I can't get out of this situation unless I catch a big break And that's also sad because why does everyone need to catch a big break to just make it in life? We can't all be famous. Yeah, exactly. Yep, exactly. It's also, we should be celebrating all people, no matter what. So you're an artist? Cool. This person's an accountant. That's also cool. You know, like everyone should be celebrated no matter where they are. I thought that was so sad to hear, I have to do this or I will not make it off the res. Well, it's sad that he's like trying to escape his home base in general. Yeah. Like, could you imagine that's where you lived every day, all day is a place you're trying to escape. Yeah. And then B, it's also extra sad that he's trying to escape to a place that notoriously has tried to kill him. You know, historically, anyway, mm-hmm. doesn't want you to exist anyway. So like, it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? Like, I got to get yeah. out of here, but I'm going to the place where it's going to be even worse. <laughs> But that's where it's better, too. Like, it's just really, really fucked up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it it shows that colonial system that it's trying to keep and trap Indigenous people on reserves. And just that ingrained belief that you're not good enough and you can't do things and you can't make a life out of just an average job. It has to be this crazy 
extravagant thing to pull them out of poverty to, for them to it's, even have a chance and that is just so sad because that's not it's like gonna happen it, for people it, it's like that observation that chris rock makes in his stand-up about how he lives on a street I'm going to screw it up because I always screw up if I retell any jokes or whatever. But the point is he lives like on this really rich neighborhood, basically. Like he is an exception, right? Like he's famous and not everybody becomes famous like Mare said, mm -hmm. but he lives on the street with a white dentist and a white chiropractor, right? Like just yeah. regular people, but they're white. It's the similar thing, right? Like if you want to achieve anything, you got to achieve it times 10 plus one and extra to even yeah. be on the baseline level of what other people get to just enjoy every day by virtue of their rights mm -hmm. supposedly yeah. right yeah then it's all taken your credibility is taken away from you as soon as you turn into an angry person you know and now Which you have every right to feel yes right, right? It, it's this never-ending cycle that just you know keeps people in there i really like the themes if you're reading and you're trying to like read between the lines those themes are there it's so sad but crazy to see that they're still there yeah. and he said he was from the spokane reservation i have people from penticton indian band going to spokane all the time so that was really cool too to be oh i bet if my friends read this they would know places he was talking about oh, i thought cool. that was yeah i thought that was neat so Very yeah cool. it's cool to read a book mm -hmm. that's placed in a place that you know because oh, you yeah, feel like right? oh I'm, it's you like, can picture wait, yourself there yeah yeah, yeah, it makes it a little bit more uh, real. Yeah. That drawing that I was showing you of his parents, this one? Yeah. What it says is who my parents would have been if someone had paid attention to their dreams. And his mm -hmm. mother would be a community college teacher. And his dad would be the fifth best jazz sax player west of the Mississippi. Like those were their dreams. That's what he's saying. Like, but no one paid attention to them. Yeah. And they didn't have the lifestyle to be able to do that. They probably had to work and work and work, you Extra. know, just to even, yeah, just to even probably put the bare minimum on the table and live. And so, of course, yeah. just even that doesn't give them the time to continue practicing these life hobbies and passions, right? It's, you, yeah. they may end up having lost it because they didn't practice it. Yeah. Yeah that's cool I gotta pick up the book because I want to see all these pictures yes yeah yeah, yeah. You gotta so pick it up. next time when we do our final episode of it I will have had the book and so I can talk about that yeah yeah all right I guess that's it great oh, the she's awake hey oh, good timing there's the dog. Oh. hey Barbara so oh my there goodness is. so cute hey puppy <laughs> all right ladies well oh, no no was... no hugs I'm just like trying to climb up. <laughs> Get out of here. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Book Interrupted. If you'd like to see the video highlights from this episode, please go to our YouTube channel, Book Interrupted. You can also find our videos on www.bookinterrupted.com. A book club is just a book without members. Join the community by following us on Facebook, Instagram, or sign up for exclusive content through our website at bookinterrupted.com slash unpublished. We'd like to give a big shout out to our listeners. Your support makes this all possible. Thank you for the uplifting feedback and for recommending us to family and friends. We love hearing from you. Please reach out through our website at bookinterrupted.com slash fans or by emailing connect at bookinterrupted.com. We appreciate you for taking time out of your busy schedule to connect with us. See you next time on Book Interrupted. Book Interrupted. Never forget, every child matters.